If you love Push Black's Black History Year, you'll love our newest podcast called Two Minute Black History. In only two minutes, you'll hear little known stories about our people and reclaim the knowledge we need to take action and advance our community. To move towards the future, you've got to look to the past. Learn the history you didn't get in school. Tune in to Two Minute Black History every Tuesday through Friday, right on the Black History Year feed and wherever you listen to podcasts. DJ Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, KRS One. These are just a handful of the innovators who pioneered hip hop, opening the pathway for a new black subculture to flourish. One where black b-boys and DJs, MCs and graffiti artists could express themselves in a style all their own. From the Bronx to Atlanta, Memphis to Compton, hip hop became a way of life, a form of resistance, and it's still alive today. I'm Jay from Push Black, and you're listening to Black History Year. Like much of black culture, hip hop has been co-opted and commercialized to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, plenty of money to erase its historical tenets, its roots. But folks like today's guest, Dr. Joyce Lynn Wilson, are making sure hip hop won't stop. And she's using STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, to do so. Joyce Lynn is an integrative curriculum designer, cultural studies educator, and faculty of hip hop studies and digital media in the School of Literature, Media, and Communications at Georgia Tech. She founded the Hip Hop 2020 Innovation Archive, an ed tech startup inspired by the intersection of teaching and learning in hip hop culture, and co-created Your Voice is Power, a curriculum learning experience with modules that teach how music, computer science, and entrepreneurship can be tools to fight racism. And I won't even get started on the revolutionary work she's done around OutKast. More on that later. First up, Today's history story about the Godfather of rap, Gil Scott Heron. Check, check it, one, two. Even if you haven't heard his music, you've heard his message. The revolution will not be televised, was him calling out injustice. But now, in the era of social media, we must ask, should the revolution be televised? Deemed the Godfather of rap, Gil Scott Heron was a writer, poet, and musician. His work fused jazz, poetry, rap, and passionate protest. Scott Heron was ahead of his time when he wrote, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. The line publicly called out television and media networks for not broadcasting news, reflecting the protests happening in the streets. And it's still relevant today. Anti-Black messaging has always been present within media, be it pro-slavery propaganda or victims of police brutality being villainized. Media works to expose information, which is why elements of our history, like the Underground Railroad, depended on secrecy. Secrecy meant safety. The news is so overrun with propaganda and fake news that only 11% of Americans trust television news. Many look to other media or influencers to stay informed, with roughly 23% of social media users having recently changed their political views due to information learned from social media. We must be careful about which sources we listen to, however. Sometimes social media is what keeps us most informed about global issues the news works to cover up. As we reimagine protesting, we switch Scott Heron's statement to a question. Should the revolution be televised? Or is it time to return to the underground? All right, Joyce Lynn, what does Black liberation look like to you? Black liberation looks like having 
the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without having to jump through any type of social and political hoops to confirm the humanity that I have. I guess I'll put it that way. Black liberation for me is having the right to be self-determined and to seek knowledge of self um, and to work on behalf of the benefit of my community. I appreciate that. And that resonates with me as well. I'm curious, dig into your work and how it connects to that. So how would you say your work aids in achieving that vision of Black liberation that you've shared? So my PhD is in educational anthropology, and I am a former high school teacher. So I come from a family of educators, whether that's been my mom, who is a retired teacher of the Atlanta Public Schools, um, my aunt, uh, rest in peace, she started a daycare center in the city that is still um, going. It's been going for the last 50 years. My grandmother, even though um, she didn't get as much education as I did, she too was an educator. So I come from a family of women and men who invest in education. And my work aligns with liberation because I am a believer in the right to education. Education for me is that turnkey, that access that one um, has to learn about who they are. You know, I believe that, of course, we live in a society where the schooling system is based on technical development. But I believe that once a person is able to understand who they are, then what their gifts are will reveal themselves and what their contribution to the community um, will reveal itself. So in the ideal way, that's how it should happen. And I've always been taught that getting an education and going to school, being a part of that, <laughs> not the way to do it, but being going to school, being a part of just the overall um, education of myself has been the way to liberate oneself and understand how to develop strategies around that and curriculum around that. And so that's how my work aligns with that purpose. So it stands out to me so far is this emphasis on knowledge of self as part of education. And I believe you touched on this, sometimes education is framed to only look a certain way to us. Um, and I've, from what I've observed, knowledge of self is not as highly valued. How have you developed knowledge of self and what's your journey been like? I have had the good fortune, and I don't, I don't say this lightly, um, or I don't say it, say it arrogantly either, I am part of old Atlanta. And what I mean by that is I went to schools with peers that look like me. I went to schools that were named after black leaders, activists, educators, emancipators, scientists. I went to school where all of my teachers were black and the white teacher or the Asian teacher that I had, these were teachers who were part of the minority. So I am part of a generation in the city of Atlanta that really stands on the shoulders of um, aspirational thinking, thought leadership, um, curriculum that has culture integrated into it. Um, I came through the school system under the leadership of Dr. Alonzo Krim. So I think for me, that paired with just the timing of growing up when hip hop was developing um, became a way for, for me to access knowledge of self. So coming up in old Atlanta and mentioned the atmosphere uh, that was around you, the peers, the teachers, um, the names of the schools, hip hop was emerging. 
how did hip hop influence you at that age? I mean, like every, pretty much every child of color, especially black kid growing up in the early eighties, we were listening to rap music and to have access to a music that felt like it was ours um, was, you know, it was, it was cool. And so um, my teachers integrated that into the classroom. It wasn't called hip hop pedagogics or integrating hip hop into the curriculum. It really was just good teaching. And so I have to make this point, like this is all historical reflection. This is, this is, I don't know this is happening, right? As a child, as a youth, as an adolescent, as a youth influencer, teen, college student, like I'm not aware of this. This is my normal um, every day. So being able to go to school and have friends that look like me and teachers who look like me listening to music that's, that resonates with me, um, you know, able to extract lessons from that music and just being a part of the overall big energy of that moment um, was really fascinating. And I think it just really contributed to who I have become as a woman, as a, as a black woman, as a scholar, um, as a cultural producer, those are the elements that i that just can really contribute to my development. What were you listening to? I was beginning to collect music at, I started collecting music at, mm, I'm think, I think I'm seven years old, maybe seven or eight years old. I had a, I had a portable record player that had the Bee Gees, a mural of the Bee Gees painted on the inside. And I had three records. It was children's favorites on vinyl, rapper's delight on vinyl and Donna summer. And all of these were records that my mom and dad gave me. And so, um, but I didn't know that this was, you know, that these were the, the roots and the beginnings of me being an archivist and ultimately becoming a, a scholar in the field of hip hop studies. So I'm fortunate in the sense that I was able to come up during a time where I heard hip hop and rap on the radio and saw it on TV when it aired, you know, um, and I, I just don't take that lightly, especially as we sit at 50 years of celebrating hip hop. So speaking of the 50 years of celebrating hip hop, talk to us a bit, it's a vast history, but a bit about uh, how it became uh, this form of cultural expression. So the genesis date that everyone is, ex is celebrating is August 11th of 1973. Uh, we know that cultures just don't spring up. So of course there were elements and evidence of what we ultimately are calling hip hop. We saw elements of that early on in the early seventies. Um, and I think it's important to look at what was happening during that time, I mean, in 73. So this is what, five years after the assassination of Dr. King. Um, I think this is what, eight years after um, the assassination of Malcolm X. Also August 11th of 1973, almost four months later in Atlanta, um, the first African-American mayor is elected, Maynard Jackson. So all of this is happening at the same time. So I think that we have to understand that the party, the back to school party that Cindy Campbell and Clive Campbell put together um, doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, they also bring this dance hall vibe, this experience with the soundstage from Jamaica, um, this idea of the DJ bringing people together to hear music that you're probably not going to hear on the radio, um, music that is has socio-political context. Because again, in the early 70s, in Jamaica, in Kingston, there's also 
uh, there's also this black revolution, li liberation movement energy happening as well. So the Campbells migrate to um, New York. What happens is a cultural reversioning process, a cultural transmission. Those ideas don't stay where they are. They come with people when they move geographically from one space to the next, and they began to get remixed and um, reversioned in that particular environment. And that's what happened. It wasn't called hip hop. It was a back to school party that was hosted by this DJ promoted by his sister. And its whole purpose was to fortify the spirits of these young kids of color who were about to go back to school. And we talk about school in the early 70s. What do we experience? We're trying to desegregate. There's white flight happening. And we're moving towards the Reagan era where, you know, arts and culture and, and, and music and creativity is literally being removed from the schools. But that energy doesn't go anywhere. These are these are young folks who are saying, OK, well, if I can't play the drums in school or get access to the saxophone, what Cool Herc and Grandmaster Flash and these early DJs, what they showed us is that we can literally take this turntable and turn that into the instrument and use these records to sample the sounds that we need to keep the party going so that the break dancers can continue to dance and the party can keep going and going and going. And so this is the energy that hip hop develops in. And it's not necessarily happening in one solo place. Um, there are elements of it that are happening in other spaces. I wonder if we were to talk to someone who may have been in Los Angeles or in San Francisco or somewhere else during that time, what was happening in your location, in your network during the early 70s or on August 11th, 1973. So these are all the elements that went into hip hop becoming what it is, this commitment to schooling um, and teaching and learning through the arts but also this idea of technological innovation through necessity. We know that when we need something, we're going to create something. Like it's almost like, you know, this idea of there's like this innate engineer <laughs> that seems to be a part of who we are as a people. And of course, people thought it was a, it was a glitch in the matrix. And ultimately, it wasn't. And here, 50 years later, we are celebrating around the world. And we're talking about like this middle age cultural phenomenon and um, that folks didn't think was going to make it to 50. So for me, celebrating hip hop at 50 is also celebrating myself and celebrating my community and celebrating my generation because we weren't supposed to make it to, to this point. What stands out to me first, this idea of being innovative out of necessity and not having access to uh, certain tools, certain instruments and creating this uh, entirely new thing. We see this with hip hop and to a great degree, with jazz music as well, right? In terms of just our experience with music as a people, uh, which you mentioned about teaching and learning and passing down culture, how far back do you go when you're tracing um, when understanding sort of that lineage? Um, so I go back to ancient Kemet. <laughs> I go back to the beginning, you know, um, ideologically, um, asking questions about what education looked at looked like at that time what was included in that pedagogical experience what was in, what was included what was the art and science of teaching and learning what did it look like during that time what were the 
ideological underpinnings that guided education at that time? And how did it show up in the media and the artifacts and the the um, visuals, you know, and can we trace a connection for that? Those are the types of questions that I ask and that my students and I tend to um, get into and try to uncover because I like for my students to enter into my class, especially if I'm teaching a course on hip hop, understanding that there's a difference between hip hop and rap. So the first question that the first thing that I, that I ask them to do is to do a psychological shift and understand that we're not necessarily talking about rap music right now. We're talking about an aesthetic. Uh, we're talking about a language. We're talking about um, an art, a, a form of education um, and a vibe and how does it get here and where does it come from and how far can we trace it back? I don't start the experience of African people living in America in America. I think it doesn't, because to do that is to stunt the growth of that and to package that experience as one that is rooted in and begins with enslavement and entrapment. As an educator, I can't do that. That would be unethical for me to do that with my students, whether they're white, black, Asian, whatever they're, wherever they're from, I cannot, as a cultural anthropologist and educator, unethically stand in front of my students and talk about something um, or talk about a community, whether whoever they are and their history beginning in colonization or apartheid or um, or desegregation or enslavement or any of those types of social and political entrapments. Unethical. I appreciate that, uh, that language. I hadn't thought about that before, um, in the, in those terms, but I absolutely agree with that. I'm curious as, huh? How common is that perspective that you shared? I think it's common. I just don't think it's ever, I rarely hear it framed that way. You know, it's politicized so much. You know, we're living in a time now where affirmative action has been reversed, where um, efforts around inclusivity are being attacked, where courses and programs and degrees and fields of study um, around the history of a particular community and ethnic population, those are all being attacked and it's being politicized. And more than anything, it's just unethical to do that. Ethics to me is about being able to talk about something um, in a fair way, in a just way, and a truthful way, and to deal with something whether that's an issue or a situation that begins with the facts and to do anything outside of that would be a lie and lying is unethical. So for me, I, I, I wouldn't do that if I was talking about um, history of Asian Americans or history of Europeans, like for me to talk about it outside of the history would be a lie and lies are unethical and I don't get involved in any politics. I stay away from the politics of that because that's exactly what it is. It's politics. And at the end of that, there's an agenda. If I do have an agenda, I'll I'll say it this way is to be the best educator that I can be so that when my students leave me, their creative capacities have been enhanced, their um, critical and leadership capacities have been enhanced. And because I'm at the Institute of Technology, you know, their STEM capacities and computational capacities have been enhanced. So that's my job. That's what I'm hired to do. And so I don't get involved in the politics of it. Because again, for me, it's unethical to do that. 
I appreciate that. I'm going to start using that language too. Um, Because I've experienced what many of us as black folks in America have experienced where, yes, our history has been taught to us as starting uh, from slavery and it has a harmful effect on uh, our minds, I believe, and what we believe is possible. Because in my opinion, by starting there, then we just perceive anything after that as progress, right? Without knowing that there's all this uh, that came before that was that surpass what the world had seen in most times of world history like that we're responsible for with the lineage of uh it's unethical to say okay this is the beginning of you if that's not really the case and i think that's uh contributes to limiting our imagination stunning our our growth and our perception of what's possible and it's not moral you know, it's not, it's just, it's just wrong to do that. Yeah, it's just wholly wrong. For sure. It's just wrong to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I lean towards conspiracy. So I'm, I, I, I use that instead of unethical because I think there is a, a intention there, but I absolutely uh, appreciate and I'm um, going to incorporate that unethical. Thank you for that. So you started getting into uh, what you teach and um, what you want your students to uh, to pick up. So uh, let's let's go farther into that. Why teach hip hop, uh, and what do we have? What do students have to learn from that? I decided that I wanted to get a PhD in education and integrate music and media into my classroom because that's what I experienced going through school. So when I graduated from, I went to the University of Georgia, I have a math degree. I went to Benjamin Mays High School, which is, um, it's, it had a math and science academy magnet program when I was in high school. I know I like mathematics. If I had gotten a degree in it, my mom told me and my mentors told me that you know, you can have options if you get this degree in mathematics. But I was also grew up being a hip hop head. I learned a lot from the music. I learned a lot about just black folks and about society and about being cool and what it meant to be fresh, you know, and all of that I learned through the music and being in the environments that I was in. So by the time I got to college, I was a full on hip hop head. And um, this is in the early 90s when hip hop is really going through one of its golden ages. So when I graduated, I moved out west and I started teaching high school mathematics, high school algebra. I also started writing for hip hop magazines. So I've written for all the market leading early magazines. I've written for The Source. I've written for Double XL. I've written for Rap Pages, Fader, uh, Wax Poetics. And um, I started seeing a connection. So between getting up every day, going to teach at this really diverse high school in LA, and in the evening, going down to Flint Publications, interacting with editors and getting my assignments, all of that on top of just my own experience of growing up in Atlanta, I was introduced to a book called Black Noise by Trisha Rose. I'd seen Hip Hop America by Nelson George, but I had never heard of Black Noise. And so I pulled it, looked at it, looked at um, Wesleyan University Press, I think is who, is who published it. I looked her up and I was like, wow. So she writes about rap music. Like this is her job. Like she's a professor. And it was at that moment that things kind of clicked for me. And I said, I want to do this, but I want to do it from an educational side. Because I also saw how my students were coming to school heavily influenced by hip hop, even when they didn't know it. And so um, I started integrating it into class. And when I say integrating hip hop, sometimes it was the integration of just techniques, 
So for example, students would come to the board to do homework problems and we would set it up like a battle. Sometimes students would um, create wraps out of the distributive property. So it also kind of impacted classroom management. Um, my students thought I was cool because I wrote for hip hop magazines. Like I had all types of cool points. Um, and so, <laughs> so when I started thinking about what I wanted to do with this, I realized through mentorship, hey, I'm going to have to get a PhD to even convince folks that hip hop belongs in the classroom as an aesthetic. Right. That it's rooted in inclusivity. It's rooted in technological innovation and it comes on the scene. It's nerdy by nature already. It's it's obsessed with schooling. It categorizes itself through schools and using a language of schooling. And so I wanted to study that. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, let's double click on that. So you realized that. You saw something, you saw an opportunity here, something that people needed to understand a different way, but you knew that um, folks would not take it seriously unless you sort of played their game and got, okay, these are the credentials you want, this is what I have, and this is how I'm gonna present this and package this to y'all. Am I understanding that correctly? That's amazing, okay. Just wanted to make sure we didn't gloss over that. That's dope, thank you, keep going. You know, you gotta understand, I'm, I'm wrestling against the brand. The brand of hip hop at this time is popular. And most of the stuff, some of the stuff that's being pushed is excessively material, violent, you know, misogyny. Those were elements that were being pushed on the popular side. So in order for me to um, get beyond that, I was going to need a credential that basically certified me as the expert in this. And I saw Trisha Rose do it. Right. And so I'm like, if she can do it, and she's a woman of color and she's at the time, I think she was at NYU. Now she's at Brown. I'm like, okay, I can do this because I see that she's done it. And now this is a field that in April of 2024 will celebrate its 30th year. A lot of folks thought that hip hop studies, were, again, like the music, was just going to be like this fad and it was just this glitch in higher education. When now, 30 years later, there are hip hop studies courses all over the world. It's not going anywhere at this point. It's infiltrated higher education in the same way that it's infiltrated so many other platforms and industries. And um, in 2001, I started my PhD program at the University of Georgia in the College of Education. And um, I wanted to look at this language of schooling. So in order for me to show people that this is a viable technology of education, hip hop is, is like this viable technology of education. What does it say about it? Right. And so my dissertation was very simple. I looked at the language of schooling and education in the American South, specifically in the music of Outkast, and began to ask questions. What does this generation, this post-civil rights generation, what does it say about education to kind of get an understanding of whether or not desegregation actually worked? What are they saying in these lyrics about teachers? What are they saying about information? What are they saying about knowledge acquisition and knowledge construction. So my dissertation was very ethnographic in that way. And so that was what my dissertation was on. It was called Outcasted and Claim and True, the language of schooling in Southern hip hop. And it was the first dissertation to come out of the College of Education at the University of Georgia around hip hop. And that was the beginning of my career. So what are some of the most critical and enlightening lessons we can learn from Outcast through your uh, extensive work? Education for a lot of African-Americans, 
doesn't happen in the schools. It's happening in what's considered these public spaces or sometimes private spaces. They're happening outside of the classroom. Um, and oftentimes they're very covert. Some of these lessons are coded. So, for example, I always say that outcasts, um, if I had to assign a theme or a principle to their work, I would call it order because they are always talking about do this before you do that. You know, big boy constantly <laughs> is, is saying you got to do this before you that, you know, um, you know, pay your beeper bill before you do that. Or, you know, don't go and get a wood grain steering wheel before you do this. You know, so those are the types of, yeah, those things are like getting up, get, even down to this idea of soul food. That song's not about food. That song is soul food is a metaphor for information, for knowledge that feeds your spirit. Of course, yeah, they're talking about soul food and talking about the things that they eat. And I'm talking about Goody Mob at this point. But if we're talking about groups like Goody Mob and Outcast, a lot of folks don't know that both of their names are acronyms. Outcast is operating under the crooked American system too long. Goody Mob is the good die mostly over bullshit. So these are embedded lessons in their music that if you don't study it and if you don't deconstruct it and then put it back together. So for me, it's like, okay, we're beyond the critique of the lyrics. Like we can go back and forth and be like, oh, did you hear when Nas said this? Or, oh, did you hear when MC Light said this? It was so dope. But when you hear an Andre 3000 say the South got something to say, we can extend that to hip hop having something to say. And so we're at a point now is like, what do we do with what we said, right? How do we integrate it into curriculum and integrate it into spaces that literally honor what it was designed to do? It was designed to teach, you know, it wasn't designed to be part of the music industry. You know, when Sylvia Robinson put Rapper's Delight on vinyl, folks, some folks didn't like that. You know, like we didn't want everybody to know about this. This was our little thing. So what it was designed to do was fortify the spirit of um, black youth, black and brown youth, particularly black and brown poor youth in, the, in a particular time who didn't necessarily get the benefits of the civil rights movement or the black nationalist movement. Some people fell through the cracks. And many of those who felt like they fell through the cracks became these, you know, hip hop aficionados and created careers out of this culture. That's great. And if I'm hearing you correctly, it seems like you're also referencing what's known as the five pillars of hip hop, where uh, emceeing, DJing, breakdance, graffiti, and knowledge being one of those. And I've seen it articulated as teaching or understanding or learning as well. I would add a sixth one. I would add a sixth one. Entrepreneurship, right? Um, I don't know why it was never there, but it should be, you know, um, that's an element. It is, this is, we're a generation that really, we value the hustle. Like you have your podcast, this is yours, right? So um, I, I think entrepreneurship would be that sixth element. And because I like the number seven a whole lot better than I like six, then I think the seventh one would be schooling. I know there's knowledge, but then there's schooling. Those are two different things. So I really believe schooling should come out as its own element. Tell us a bit about um, the curriculum that you're most excited about and getting um, some strong reception from, and you know, where's that headed? I was brought in on your voices power during, uh, COVID and during, um, the tragedy of George Floyd. Um, so your voices power for years was, and it still is a partnership between Amazon future engineer, 
um, EarSketch, which is a software that uses music production to teach coding and Python. During COVID and during the tragedy of George Floyd, um, they decided that the next iteration for Your Voice is Power had to be also the remixing of lyrics. So the idea with Your Voice is Power is students have access to EarSketch. They're taught to use EarSketch and they can take a song and remix it. So these students around the world uh, for this competition would remix the song using um, the techniques of EarSketch, not even knowing that they're learning how to code and that they're learning Python. So the idea was to use music and culture as pathways to helping um, youth and youth influencers learn computational thinking, creative thinking, um, computer science, um, but using some of their favorite songs to do it. So I have a research project called the Hip Hop 2020 Innovation Archive. And the whole idea of Hip Hop 2020 is to design curriculum that borrows from the artifacts. Again, going back to what we were just saying earlier, is it's great to collect, it's great to deconstruct lyrics, it's great to say, ooh, I got a, a vinyl collection of 50,000 records. The question is, what are we doing with it? So for me, I want to be able to use those artifacts to make things, whether that's making a digital archive, whether that's making curriculum, but there's no methodology for that. There's been no methodology for analyzing the lyrics. So I, I have to tell you this part so that I could bring this all together. Um, when I first started this work, you know, hip hop is always talking about authenticity and realness, but we really don't have a way to quantify that. It's like, you know, the question of when does keeping it real go wrong? Like that Dave Chappelle would ask on his show, we would laugh about it, but it was really a, a good question. Like, what is it to be authentic and to be real? Well, that too is an ideological sample that we could trace back to the ideas of ma'at that comes out of ancient Kemet and these seven ma'atic principles that are all about being ethical, being moral, being authentic, being yourself. So when I first started Hip Hop 2020 as a curriculum project, students in my class, I started my career at Morehouse. Shout out to Morehouse, they gave me my stripes. When I would have my class Students would analyze the lyrics for these principles and those seven principles being truth, justice, balance, harmony, reciprocity, order and righteousness. But it was very difficult for them to remember, you know, and me being a math teacher or having this mathematical training and understanding stuff like PEMDAS. You remember PEMDAS? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, like in algebra where you <laughs> you work in the parentheses first, then you go, you know, so I I wanted to create something like that so that my students could understand what to code for. And so it took me a few years to develop it, but I developed something called the outcast imagination, where I remixed the original acronym for operating under the cricket American system too long, which is seven letters. And I created a remix of Ma'at, but within the context of Bloom's taxonomy. So that students can have these principles that they can mine for in the lyrics. So O is for open-minded thinking. U is for uprightness. Like where do you see moral or ethical tension in the lyrics like what's the issue like what is the, the the what is ice cube wrestling with as the narrator you know the t stands for truth whether you see truth or elements of it or lack thereof the k being kinship whether you see 
kinship, not necessarily kinship around family, but kinship maybe around ideas or kinship around friendship, you know, so elements of that or lack thereof. Um, the, the A is accountability. Where do you see the artist take being accountable or not? Right. Um, and the S is for sequence, which lines up with the Maotic principle order. So where do we see this idea of having to crawl before you walk or walk before you run or this, you know, is there any evidence in these in these lyrics about order and sequence? And then that last one is about teaching. Where do you see teaching take place? And is love being taught or is hate being taught? So those that became my methodology for or my hermeneutic for students to use to analyze lyrics. And that's the part that got integrated into the Your Voices Power curriculum for the Pharrell installation, because at this point, we wanted students to be able to understand how lyrics, not just the musicality of a song, but how lyrics plus that musicality can be remixed to create new songs. It's not just for rap music, right? Um, it's for any type of text. It's also, I teach courses in design and computational media. So beyond just the text, how can we use hip hop to inspire design thinking? I have a theory. Hip hop is nerdy by nature and it's deep by design. It's always, it has its own way of thinking about form and flow and function. Rakim talks about form. He talks about his flow and the function of it. So how can we borrow from those aesthetics um, as designers and makers and apply that to something that may have a hip hop feel to it, but doesn't necessarily have to have a hip hop feel to it. So the outcast imagination is also a design hermeneutic. We can use it to analyze lyrics, but we can also use it um, to guide the way we think about creativity. So for the design side, the O stands for open access thinking or open accessibility rather. How accessible is your video game that you're making? You know, how accessible is your digital archive or your virtual archive that you're creating? Um, so it's a set of seven principles that students use to guide their design thinking. So the OI serves two purposes and it was integrated into your voice's power specifically for its annotation value. I appreciate you laying that out for us and exciting to hear about um, how you've packaged this and remixed it in a way that uh, is both relatable to the students and useful. It's been a long time though. It's not like I'm explaining it so clearly, but this has been years of just scientific research and seeing what works and trying it out. And like when I noticed that my students were not remembering those principles, I was like, I got to figure out something that will help them remember. Um, and it and it has it has worked and we're continuing to, to develop it. That's incredible. What does it look like? What effect does this program have at scale? So I've been able to scale Hip Hop 2020 in a variety of ways. Um, so I have a VIP team, for example. Um, it's a vertically integrated project team of about 12 students from campus, from different majors, who sign up to be a part of my team and work on different sub teams for different components of Hip Hop 2020. So there is, for example, my um, software engineering team who work on all of my back end. And then there is my digital archiving sub team. And they're working on the digital archive that I think you may or may not have seen online. And then there's my virtual reality team who is building out the virtual component where folks can step into this alternative world and experience the archive and the pieces that we have in the archive. 
again, going back to that O and open accessibility, um, I think it's important for if we're talking about scale, universities and colleges, they have to scale to a point where this knowledge is available to the communities that created it. Right. So a lot of times communities can't get to Harvard. They can't get to Georgia Tech. They can't get to some of these spaces. So how do we use the um, consciousness of hip hop to design um, platforms that are accessible to the people that actually need them? So, so that component is in there. So I've been scaling this for, again, it started at Morehouse in 2008. And I have been slowly scaling this up for the last 15 years. For Your Voice is Power, we're working with middle and high school students. Um, on the other side, I'm working with post-secondary students and college students. Um, one of my dearest friends and colleagues, Bettina Love, she designs curriculum for elementary students. There's Lauren Kelly at Rutgers. She works with middle school students. So. The scaling um, is there, right? Uh, because these are opportunities, uh, the opportunities that I'm talking about are not missing the students who actually need it. And when I say that, I don't mean that this is a um, intervention. Integrating hip hop and culture and music and media is not an intervention. It's not something where it's like, oh, where. These are these are kids who can't learn like other kids. No, this is good teaching. It doesn't have to be called anything other than that. Education and culture and teaching, those are all synonymous terms. They're all part of the same village. So this is not uh, I want to make sure that when we're talking about hip hop in the classroom. This is not some intervention for at promise or at risk students because they can't graduate. That's not what it is. This is the standard education, actually, that all students need from all backgrounds. And that's where we, what we're seeing with hip hop. This is why it's still here, because even when we extract it from the industry, it is a culture that has given so many people an opportunity to be their authentic self, regardless of their race or their class or their gender. And it's even forcing hip hop to own up to its inclusive properties and qualities and values that it stands on by including other folks and other communities and other demographics. Um, so I don't, I don't say that lightly. I think that when you ask the question about black liberation, I believe because of the history of African-American people, particularly in America, when black folks win, everybody else seems to win. So if we can figure out <laughs> the way in which we design curriculum such that it is helping black people, then everybody else is going to benefit from it. And that is what hip hop has shown us. So I think that it's always going to be somewhere, whether it's called hip hop, whether it's called culturally relevant pedagogies, whether it's just good teaching. Right. And so I think that's the scaling of it. And when we look at hip hop at 50 years old, the question is, where does it go next? I think that it's going to be these classrooms and these higher education spaces that allow for it to really circle back to those, those more high vibrational themes and components that it's known for. Dr. Joycelyn Wilson, I appreciate you joining us on Black History Year. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was Dr. Joycelyn Wilson, curriculum designer and cultural studies educator. To learn more about her work, visit www.drjoyce.net. And for more info on the 44 Beat Lab, visit www.44beatprojects.org. 
That's four, like the number four spelled out. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. We believe telling empowering stories on black life and history can build a more liberated black future. Being here with us lets us know you probably feel like that's important too. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value this work. And you make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most people do five or 10 bucks a month, but really everything makes a difference. Thank you for supporting the work. Black History Year is a production of Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. Our team includes Tariq Alani, Brooke Brown, Tasha Taylor, Somalia Rahman, Amber Davis, and Darren Wallace. Producing this episode, we have Sydney Smith and Lynn Webb for Push Black, and Ronald Young Jr., who also edits the show. Black History Year's executive producers are Lily Workna and me, Julian Walker. Peace.